And now, with Sound Investing, here's Paul Merriman. Uh, our, our mission uh, is really about giving you the tools and the information to manage money on your own. Uh, I am going to make the case before I'm done uh, as, as to how you can make uh, additional millions of dollars in your life. And you'll see that we'll do it by the numbers. But one of the biggest decisions you will make is whether you do it yourself. And I don't mean you pick individual stocks, but that you will take care of your money on over your lifetime rather than having to hire somebody to do it for you. It is a huge decision. And uh, Warren Buffett, I think, give some of the best advice within our industry. And what he says is, and before he said this, he said to be a success. So this wasn't only about investing. He said, you only have to do a very few things right in your life, so long as you don't do too many things wrong. And as far as I'm concerned, and I've been around this business, the, the process of investing since I was 19 years old, I am 79 years old. I've been doing this a long time. And I will tell you, from everything I've seen, the simpler you can make it, the higher the probability of success. And I think it is, uh, uh, is, it is very, very important for, for people to understand that it's about the math. When you talk about how to be a great investor, it is really about the ability to follow the math. This industry, I had to, to think to myself about what you're going through and what you're, you're deciding to do with your life. And some of you may go on to graduate school, and, but you're going to go on. You're going to have these careers filled with solving major, major problems. I come from a career, literally, where in a couple of weeks, you can study and you can take a test and you can pass it. and you are in the business. You are giving people advice. You are acting friendly like you're a friend and you act and talk like you know what's gonna happen. You pretend that somebody in your organization can see into the future. The fact is this industry, unlike yours or whatever industry you go into, most of the people would not survive in your industry because if you look for two things in your life, to, to, to take guidance from, to look to for, for advice and, and information that you can trust. You are looking for competent people who are ethical. And I will tell you that, I'm not going to say most, but many of the people in the financial industry are not very competent and, uh, and they are not very ethical. And the problem is, if you're not careful, you end up in the hands of somebody who in fact sounds competent, sounds ethical. We, we, we know in this, industry. when I went to school, when I was 22, back to New York, to the Institute of Finance, and it, what it was really was a sales training to go into the securities industry. I, I don't know that it should have been considered an institute, but that's what they called it. And what they told us, what they told us is things like, it's the... It's the sizzle, not the steak you're selling. Uh, they would tell us that you are a fool to recommend many of the things that you, rec that you do to potential investors, but as long as you're able to find a bigger fool to sell it to, you're doing a good job. I mean, it is in many ways a, an industry that is just ripe not only with sales pitches that are carefully designed to motivate you to do what they want, what, not what you would do if you followed the math, but many of them are liars. And the reason I know they're liars uh, is because the studies show that about 5 to 13%, depends on what study that you look at, uh, of people are just liars. And the problem is, if you're listening to a liar and they are able to pitch in a way that gives you a sense of trust and friendship and all those things that you might look for in a long-term relationship, 
you can get yourself in a lot of trouble. And what I love about your position, you are at an age where you're learning the things that are most important. And many, in fact, including many engineers, would tell you, I didn't learn this stuff until I was 30 or 40 years old. Here's some numbers. Here's some math. Pretty simple stuff. And, 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 and what it says to me, well, let, first of all, let, let me just highlight the fact that there's a number here. Whoops, excuse me. A number of 0.5, one half of 1%. One half of 1% can change your life. If not change your life, it'll change the life for somebody else. I'm in the process right now of putting some money into uh, a brand new child. My, my first granddaughter was just born last week. And I just talked to her mother, my daughter today, and we're making the plans to get together and put together the investment that's going to be there to, to, to in essence, underwrite the Roth IRA for my, God, my, my, my granddaughter when she starts to be able to put money into the Roth. And what I know is, if we can invest the money efficiently, that extra one half of 1%, if we can find it somewhere in the industry, could lead to a lot of extra money. And so what I've done is show you here a table that assumes a couple of easy things. One, that you put away $6,000 for 40 years, $240,000. You make during the 40 years of accumulation, 8%, and then you retire. And in the period of retirement, you make 6% and you live on 4% of that. And so that means that the person who makes an 8% return would, in fact, end up at the age of retirement with $2.8 million. And then you start uh, taking the money out of, I'm sorry, that was, that was $1.6 million right here, 1.6, 1.7. That's what you have at retirement. And then you start taking the money out 4% a year and over 30 years, you would take out $2.6 million. Now that would then over those, uh, uh, the 40 years plus the 30 years, uh, you would have then uh, access to uh, about a total of about $5.5 million. But if you could find somewhere to find an extra half a percent and make eight and a half percent instead of eight and make six and a half percent instead of six, instead of ending up with 1.7, you end up with 1.9 when you reach 65. Instead of uh, taking out 3.8, or 2.6, you take out 3.2 instead of dying and leaving 3.7, or I'm sorry, 2.8, you leave 3.7. The total difference then between what you would have in scenario two and scenario one is about one and a half million dollars. That comes from a half of 1%. But what if you were able to make another one half of 1%. Well, you know the answer. The answer is basically you would be doubling, doubling the return that you would have uh, over a lifetime, a lifetime to live, to live on the money and the lifetime of, of saving for other people at your death. So instead of a, about one and a half million dollars, it turns out to be about $3.5 million. And that 1%, right there. I'm going to show you 12 ways I think you can add a million dollars to your portfolio in this presentation tonight. But that 1% is what people charge to manage their money, which says to me, if you could get the entire 9% instead of giving 1% to the advisor, if you could get the entire 7% instead of giving 1% to an advisor, you get to keep the $3.5 million. And you all were given uh, a, a link to my book. We're talking millions. I have no idea how many actually looked at the book, but I can tell you that there are, all of these 12 are in the book. Now, 
I'm going to go beyond the book tonight and take you into actual portfolios you could use in your retirement that have just been killer portfolios in the past. Now, this seems like a pretty obvious one. We'll start with a, with a real easy extra million dollars. Obviously, if you don't save, you are behind the eight ball. And so you're going to leave a million dollars uh, on the table for the person uh, who does save. And you and I know, we know that, that society, the capitalistic system, businesses don't want you to save. Well, the banks may, the, the Schwab and Fidelity may, but, but most businesses want you to spend. When I teach high school classes, I, I ask them to make a list of the people who want you to save and invest. And typically they come up with mom and dad, maybe grandma and grandpa. And then I ask for a list of the people they want to spend. Well, you know the answer. It's everybody else. And so the key is to have the discipline to save. And a lot of people will say, well, you know, I don't want to give up things to save. I want to, I want to enjoy this money. Well, at 79, I can tell you, I am enjoying the money that I saved. And in fact, because I saved, my wife and I can give away about 30% a year of what we make to causes that we care about. And the good news is that includes children as well as charitable causes. So there is lots of wonderful spending that comes from saving. In fact, I can tell you, some of the best spending you will ever do will come from the period of saving. Well, I wanna share one more thing. That, that first million dollars that you put aside there or that, that you built from saving, you have control to increase that considerably. And the way that you can increase it is by simply, instead of saying, okay, I'm gonna put away $6,000 a year, you say, I'm gonna add 3% a year every year to what I contribute. You might do that because inflation historically has been about 3%. So you're kind of keeping up with the cost uh, of inflation and the impact it has on the money that you make in your portfolio. Well, it turns out if you went from 6,000 to uh, what, 3% of 6,000, it, it, it sounds like anybody could afford 180 bucks, $15 a month, not a big deal. But then you do that every year. And over that same period of 40 years of saving and, uh, uh, and another uh, 30 years of spending, instead of having 8.9 million, you have 12 almost, 12.5 almost million dollars you have added because you invested a little more than an extra hundred thousand dollars you have added 3.5 million dollars this is not about the market this is not about something else making you money it's about you taking the steps to make money and the earlier you get started I am so excited for my granddaughter. Uh, I, I'm not gonna spoil her. This money that, that, that I'm putting away, uh, and I've done this for every grandchild, uh, the money I'm putting away is not for now. It's not, it's not for getting an education. It's not for going on great trips when you're 30 and 40 and 50. It is purely, purely for the last third of, of her life. And what I know is, if I have time on my side, and the problem is, I don't have time on my side. I am thrilled to be here tonight because I don't have very much longer to live. And if I can actually change the financial future of a handful of students here this evening, I've done some good work. But the work I can do for a newborn child, the work I can do for a 10-year-old or a 20, well, you are a 21-year-old in many cases or close to it, 
it makes a difference because if you put away a dollar a day from the, the day a child is born and, you, and, and, that, and that continues to happen until they're 70 years of age and you get a 10% compound rate of return, that is the rate of return of the S&P 500 since 1928, that would turn into $2.9 million. But if I wait until, or you do when you have a child or you have a grandchild someday, wait until they're 10 years old and do the same thing. And instead of having 2.9, that missing that $3,650 investment will cost you 1.1. That is the impact of starting sooner. If you started when they're 20 years old, it'll turn into about 425,000. The sooner you get started, the bigger the impact. It's huge. So we have one more table of math here, tables of numbers. I, I, abs I absolutely think they are just as important as the hypothetical returns of past, of, of, of past uh, returns on, on different kinds of investments. Because this tells me right now that if I, can, if I can step up and start at age 25 instead of 30, and if I get 9% and 7%, and I, if I take out 4% during that 30 years and I do all of that, in one case where I start at age 30, I'll end up with $7.8 million. If I wait, uh, uh, if I started when I was 25, I'd end up with 12.5 million, about a $4.7 million difference because of that five years of early contribution. And I know I'm talking to a room full of people who aren't even 25. So you can even make a bigger difference. And sometimes for what it's worth, Sometimes it means you, 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 you might even, well, with this group of people from everything know about what you all are likely to make when you go out and start making a living, that you'll make a good enough living to be able to put a decent amount away if you can control your spending. And I found historic, I've been doing this since the, the mid 60s. I've been in this and around this industry for a long time. The group that I could always count on being relatively frugal as a group and being good savers as a group, the best group are the engineers. And so uh, I, I love talking to you folks because I know how most of you are likely to be from everything I know about my past. I have two people that work for me. They, they volunteer their time. Um, one electrical, uh, what one was an analyst, systems analyst for Boeing before he retired. Another was with NVIDIA before he retired. I know the difference about the way engineers think versus the way people like me think. I am not an engineer. I'm not even a certified financial planner. I did sell a business that grew from nothing to about $1.5 billion under management because I learned these things that made people make money. I never made a penny for a client. And you will not be the one to make the money. The market makes the money. The thing is you have to do the right thing with the money. And sometimes they be people like me to encourage them to, to be there to help them when things start going wrong because they can't, they feel like they can't trust the future. I know there are a lot of people who got out of the market recently because of all the volatility and it's been a bear market and then today happens and if you don't know it it was one of the big days in stock market history and there are a lot of people who not only missed today but i know people that got out of the market in in the spring of 2009 because they couldn't take the market going down more and seeing their investments evaporate well, you're going to find out in a few minutes, evaporation of your money is part of the process. And sometimes you need somebody there to hold your hand to keep you in that process. I hope you don't need somebody to do that. I told you I would show you a bunch of ways to make an extra half of 1%, or at least ways to make an extra million dollars. So we know that if you'll save, you'll probably make an extra million dollars over not saving. If you save sooner, if you save more, I mean, they're all easy things to understand. 
stocks versus bonds, this is the best of everything in terms of being able to add a big, big number to what you have at the end of your life. Now, I'm not telling you you should be in stocks for the rest of your life, by the way, because stocks have compounded to 10. And by the way, that's the high quality stuff. There are stuff that more types of stocks that are more risky than the high quality stocks that makes a lot more money than the high quality stocks do. And the reason they make more money is the same reason stocks make more money than bonds. Bonds are less risky. Bonds are a guarantee. Somebody says, let me borrow $1,000 from you. I promise, I guarantee I will pay you back. Now, there are ways, times when you will find out in your life that some promises are not very good. Like when you loan money to a friend, sometimes you never get it back. Or you loan money to a child and sometimes you never get it back. But when you buy bonds like government bonds or high grade corporate bonds, you get it back when it matures. But the stock market is different. You don't get any guarantee, except you get to own a piece of the company. And stocks historically, not one by one, and I'll talk about that in a second, but in the totality, for example, of the S&P 500 have compounded at this 10%. Bonds, historically, about five. So if I'm right, that a half a percent will make you an extra million. And by the way, you're going to be investing more than $6,000 a year. You're going to get probably going to work for some company that, that's going to match part of what you put in. So the 6000 and the money it grew to in, in the math that we've looked at so far is peanuts compared to what you're likely to have. But here's what I do know. I do know that there are 10 half percents between the 5% of the 10%. So that means I should get an extra, what do you know, but maybe 5 million, I'm sorry, $10 million. Well, let me just show you how that works. If I look, for example, over, over 40 years, put away the $6,000 a year, if I did that with stocks, it would turn into about $2.6 million. If I did it with bonds, it would be about $725,000. Then I took distributions out of those stocks. Let's just stay in stocks. Then I would get about $10 million in distributions. The bonds would get me $1.1 million. Then I die and I leave $14.3 million or less than $1 million. Now that's based on 10% based on versus 5 I've looked at every 40-year period since 1928, and the worst 40-year period was a compound rate of return of 8.9. And I will tell you, you'll see this in a few minutes, the average 40-year period since 1928 for the S&P 500 is 11%, not 10. So I'm making the case, and you may not believe it, and by the way, uh, while I may not have time to take all of your questions tonight, because I know you're going to be exhausted after an hour and a half, I, I will be. I'll be here to answer questions, but I will, I will tell you this. If you have questions about what I present tonight, paul at paulmerriman.com. And in the subject line, just put in Rutgers, okay? I will know, and I will know that that is a question that I am obligated, that I promise to answer. Now, if you ask me what stock I think is going to be good for the future, um, I will answer, but you won't get an answer because I have no idea. If you ask me what mutual fund I like for the future, if you don't know by the end of this presentation, I failed. Another fork in the road, one stock versus many. Now, we all know the way to have many stocks in a portfolio. I'm, well, if you don't, it's a mutual fund. It's you know, a whole bunch of money put in a fund managed for millions of people, oftentimes millions of people, by professionals to do the right things at the right time. Now, there's one kind of particular mutual fund that is probably, from for 99% of investors, the right 
mutual fund to be in. And I'll make sure you know that before I'm done. But the one stock, one stock, there's a possibility of total loss, total loss. Eastern Airlines, total loss. Washington Mutual, total loss. Enron, the seventh biggest corporation, public corporation in the country, gone. From number seven, slowly within a couple of years to nothing. And so that's the reason I don't want you to put all your money in one stock. Now, you might say, well, doesn't it make sense that if you can find the, the really, really great stocks, that you would make a lot more than 10%? And of course, I invested in a company over 30 years and it compounded at over 30%. I would have no idea how to recommend a company like that again. Let's say for the sake of discussion, I just got lucky, but I only put $15,000 in it. If I knew it was going to make 30%, wouldn't I want to put more than 15,000? 30 was enough, by the way, but, but you, you see the point. I mean, you, we always know what we should have done. There is no risk in the past. And that's one of the, that's one of the weaknesses of listening to a sales pitch from this industry. We always talk about, we know how it's going to be because we somehow give you the sense that the future will look like the past. Well, if it came to trying to pick an individual stock, there is nobody who can tell you what that great stock is going to be, which is why the academics tell us that the smart thing to do is to buy them all, own the whole market. There's this wonderful study by uh, Dr. Bessenbinder from Arizona State University. And here's basically what he made. The question was, do stocks outperform treasury bills? Now, remember, I said that bonds made 5% uh, historically, but that's not treasury bills. Treasury bills are super, super uh, risk, have super low risk. They produce about a 3% compound rate of return. In fact, 3.3, because they make three tenths of 1% more than inflation has over the last uh, 94 years. So. What did they find when they looked at how much stocks outperformed the, the treasury bills uh, over that period? In fact, the period was from 1928 to 2016. What did they find? I was, I was fascinated by this. This is about the stocks as a group that compounded at 10%, 4% of them made huge returns, 96% of them compounded at about 3% a year and about half of them ended up not making any money at all or being broke. Now what that says is that one out of 25 companies was what in fact helped the total market compound at 10%. Now there's another part of the market that they compounded at over 12. There's another that they compounded at over 13. Uh, there are different pieces, aspects of the market, and I'll share those with you. But my point is, is the academics think it is way safer, much more probable to own the entire S&P 500, the largest 500 companies in the US, if you wanna have all your money in large companies in the US. And there's nothing wrong with that, but the expected rate of return is 10%. And that return comes including the companies that failed. So yes, you might make more than 10. In fact, you probably will for some periods, but when you have few stocks, there's also a very high likelihood that you will underperform. High expenses versus low expenses versus no expenses inside the mutual fund. Most of you will invest in mutual funds because most of you will have the majority of your, at least the early years 
uh, when you're accumulating money, it's going to be inside of a 401k, and you're probably going to be investing in mutual funds so that you get the broad diversification. And some mutual funds have high expenses, and some mutual funds have low expenses, and some have no. And the academics, and by the way, before I mention the academics, one more time, I want to tell you something that I think is very important. I think one of the biggest decisions that you will make as an investor is who you trust, the information, the source of information you trust. And I see three sources. One is Wall Street, the insurance companies, the banks, the brokers. I don't trust them. Now, it isn't that they aren't smart, but I don't trust them because they are basically foremost driven as a group by greed. And uh, most of those are public companies. And those companies have a, 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 a fiduciary responsibility to do everything they can to make money for the shareholders of the company. Yes, they'd like you to make money too. Otherwise, they don't ever make any money. But they really, their first job is to answer to the boss, not to the client. And so I'm not a fan of Wall Street. I'm also not a fan of Main Street. Main Street, a, a relative. In fact, Thanksgiving's coming up. And, and, and you may have somebody at the table talking about the, how to make money in the stock market these days. Well, or by the way, how the stock market is a terrible place to put money. All you do is lose. That's bad advice, too. But I don't like Main Street as a source. There's no way I can test it. I can know, I can, I don't know what they were telling people yesterday even. I just know what they're telling me today. How can I develop the history I need to make a qualified decision? I can't. The only street I trust is what I call University Street or the academic community. They are the only group of people that I know. And by the way, they aren't without conflicts of interest either. But I don't know any other group of people that have to answer to a, a group of peers when they do research and come out with a statement about what they find. Again, I want to remind you that it takes almost no education to become a top salesperson as a security salesperson. And most of you, if you ever go that route, if you ever hand, end up in the hands of a, of a security salesperson, it, it is likely going to be because you have totally disregarded my advice. <laughs> because I think and academics tell us that the one thing that really counts, the one thing that is dependable and that you can count on for a lifetime is if you are in investments that have high expenses, you are guaranteed to make those lower returns forever. And for people who are in mutual funds with low expenses, you are guaranteed to make the difference between the low expense and the high expense. And if you're in a mutual fund that has no expenses, and when I was your age, there was no such thing as an index fund. There really wasn't. Yeah, there were a few no-load funds where there was no commission to get in, but most of the mutual funds that pardon me, were being purchased, were being purchased with a load, with a commission, and had high expenses. But today, we have index funds. I'll talk about them more in a few minutes. But you can get ex mutual funds with no internal expenses to run the fund. Now, I can tell you the fund that offer those is a come on, because they are just hoping, they're hoping that one of these days, you're going to get out of that fund and go into something that's been doing better lately because the industry loves to sell people things that have been doing better lately. The fact is one of the worst mistakes you can make as an investor is to chase fads, to chase returns, to chase what feels like magic. Cryptocurrency, this is only, by the way, in the minds of a whole bunch of people, including Warren Buffett, we're talking magic. And so Warren Buffett doesn't have any money in cryptocurrencies. I've never had any money in cryptocurrencies. I can't figure it out. I'm serious. 
I got to hang on here for a second. I see that I, I lost a, a connection. Excuse me. I tell you, it's not easy getting old. You can't see, you can't hear, but I can make the connection. Okay, thanks for waiting. That can be that difference between low expenses and, and the expenses you could pay could be 1%. I mean, I'm looking for ways to help you make an extra half a percent. And along comes a guarantee that you can buy access to the market for a half a percent, a percent, in some cases, more than 1% cheaper. And the good news is there are lots of people now on the internet that help you do it at zero cost. I help you do it at zero cost. Then you come to another fork in the road. And that is, am I going to buy an actively managed fund or an index fund? Let's make sure we understand the index fund. Let's just think of the S&P 500. I could be an actively managed, um, active manager uh, in a mutual fund, and my job is to find the best stocks out of that 500. My job is to know when to get in and when to get out. I am working for you. I promise I really am because if I can beat the market, money will come rolling into my mutual fund. I will be rich if 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 I can show you performance that's better than those those terrible index funds. I mean, who would ever want to be average? was the sales pitch against the index fund. In fact, when it when it originally came out in 19, the first one in 1976, it, it was called Bogle's Folly. Who would ever want a mutual fund that owned all of the companies rather than owning the very best companies? Who wouldn't want somebody smart sitting there every day trying to, to, to make the right decision where to be? That was how they viewed the process of investing. And what, is, what, what does Warren Buffett say about investments? We should make an investment as if it is an investment for a lifetime. When he buys a company, he thinks he wouldn't mind if the market closed down and didn't open up for 10 years because he was in a great company. Now, what do we know about these actively managed funds versus the funds that own everything in that what we call asset class? There are big companies and small companies, two different asset classes. There are growth and value, and I'll explain that in a minute, but they're two different asset classes. There's international, there's U.S., again, different international classes. So if you're going to build index funds, you would build one for every one of these major asset classes. And that's what they've done. Index funds now represent about half of all the money that is invested. There are, are states, like I think California may be one, but there are, there are huge pension funds where the only thing they buy are index funds because they know they don't have to pay a manager. They were told for decades that you have to have a manager in order to get a good return. It turns out, and there's a firm that tracks, there's a firm that tracks the, the uh, indexes versus the active managers. And they look at all of the active managers in each of these asset classes, and they've looked at them over the last 20 years, and they update the lists every six months. And here's what we know. About one out of 10 will do better than the index. And what the academics teach us, yes, that's easily a, a, a random event. That could happen with dart throwing. Now, of course, it is easy to say, no, no, no. You know, people who make better than the indexes, they got something up here. They must understand something better. And it, and, and for 15 years, there was a fellow who beat the S&P 500. And money just poured in, poured in. And then for the next 10 years, he was one of the worst managers in the whole industry. 
think in terms of the math, the probabilities. If you're sitting there and you're thinking about probabilities and you can say, wait a minute now, there are 10 managers and I don't know what their performance is going to be. I don't even know what the what the benchmark will be, but I know that the benchmark mark is likely or the index is likely to beat nine of the 10. So if somebody will just turn over the index fund, I'll be happy with that. Or would you pick from the other nine the fund that you think is likely to be the best over the next 10 years? Well, I hope probability-wise, particularly since we know that there is not a correlation for the returns for the next 10 years based on the last 10 years. If there was a really high correlation and if there was a really big payoff, but the extra money that they make is actually fairly small, but it was enough to say that they did beat the index. And oh, by the way, how would you feel if you found out that the bottom 25% of the people who did not beat the index left about 2% a year on the table, 2% a year. And we're talking a half a percent as being important. Here are the returns for bond funds, the, the I'm not bond funds, but three different kinds of bonds. Uh, STGB, short-term government bond. Short-term government bond is very, very low risk because that's the treasury bill, 3.3% compound rate of return, and $100 grew to $2,040. Or if you went out to a, a longer maturity and you bought the intermediate term government bond, ITGB, it was a 5% compound rate of return, and the $100 grew to 10228 And if you wanted to take a very long-term government bond, in other words, the government is saying, I will borrow your money and I'll pay you 30 years from now or 20 years from now, the return was 5.6%. But notice the worst one-year return. Notice the little, the, the, the T-bill, the short-term government bond, almost didn't have a losing year. It was a break even. And by the time you get out to the long-term government bond, it was down 14.9%. That was from 1928 to 2021. I love the lesson that you're about to learn because a whole bunch of people have learned this lesson this year. And it's an important lesson. The period of time, from 1928 to 2021 is statistically meaningful, but it's a very short period of time. I, I, I mean, I, I'm not saying that we have to go uh, for billions and billions of years or anything, but I am saying that a lot of things can happen that didn't happen between 1928 and 2021. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because the long-term government bond this year, a week or so ago, was down 33% this year. It is on its way, theoretically, to having the worst year it has over the last 95. And it may be by twice the loss that we see her on this table. That's an important piece of information to you for you to have. But we can't let the bad years scare us because one year when you're putting money away for 40 is meaningless. Well, pardon me, it's not meaningless totally, but it isn't what you, if you focus on that, you think you're going broke. This is what the average compound rate of return was for those same three bond types, 4.5, 5.9, and 5.8. So, you know something? Not bad. And $100 grew to be worth a, a fair amount. That probably for many people would say, like, isn't that good enough? Well, it's good enough unless you know that over the last 94 years, 
that LCB, US LCB, the S&P 500, compounded at 10.2 and $100 grew not to $2,000, but 917,000 plus. And then you have US LCV that compounded at 11.2. Now, this is also a fascinating piece of information. That index, that group of companies, that asset class represents companies that are out of favor, companies that are not viewed as being great growth companies of the future. LCB, the S&P 500, oh man, you can't, hard to find the name of a company that's, that's a hot dog, great growth company that's not there. Some, but most of the great companies are there. But a large cap value, if you saw a list, they're not the big performers. And yet, and yet the numbers show historically that they produce a better return over the long term than those high-powered, great growth companies as a group. But you took more risk. Ah. So it's not magic. It's, it's the reward for taking more risk. It's the reward for being in stocks rather than bonds. And it's the reward for being in large companies. And it's the reward for being in some companies that are out of favor. And I don't mind having both of those in my portfolio. The next one is US SCB. U.S. companies, small companies, small cap blend, some growth, some value, just like the S&P 500, some growth, some value. Again, a better return. And now the $100 grows to $4.6 million. And then you go to the next one. It's, it's U.S. small cap value. Forget about the growth in the small company. Just own the out-of-favor small companies. And don't think that every year small cap value does better than the S&P 500. I don't have time to go into this today, but I will tell you, we have studies that show that you'll have 20-year periods that the S&P 500 does better than small cap value. And then small cap value takes off like a rocket. Last couple of years, small cap value has been way, way better than the large cap blend. Over there to the right, those other columns, I'm going to talk about those later. But just pretend for a second. You were going to do something for a child, your first child. Put some money away for the long term. Now, I'm kind of a wacky guy. I When I say long-term, if I have the ability to put away money long-term on behalf of somebody, and it could compound tax-free for the rest of their life, and by the way, when you're doing that for a child, you really can't get it into the Roth until they earn some money. But you can have the money they're growing for them so that when they do earn some money, it gets in there. And if part of that money don't is, have people time. And there and there and there are some people who will part of their money will grow for a hundred years. I mean, in theory, you could put away $365 and let it go for 70 years. At 12%, it would be worth about a million bucks. Then the next year, you put away $365 for the little tyke, and you put it there for 70 years. Don't touch it for 70 years. 70 years later, when they're 71, it's worth over a million bucks if it gets 12%. It's worth about $488,000 if it gets 10%. And you do that every year, $365. It's not impossible to have money actually grow for 70 to 100 years. And people will say, well, isn't that an awfully long time? Well, I'm not suggesting that you stop living for the next 70 years. I'm just suggesting that you plan. By the way, when we, 
Oh, I forgot to show you something. Notice, if you will, here, the very best one-year return. Right here, 54% for the S&P 500. The worst year was a loss of 43, okay? Now, this is important. When you're a long-term investor, please understand any year could be the worst year. I mean, in theory, your $100 could grow to $13 million, theoretically. And then the next year, go down 50%. And there you go. Instead of $13 million, you got 6.5. So you never outgrow that possible risk, which is why for most of us, when we get to be uh, 60, 65, we want to have some bonds in our portfolio. We want to act like old people who don't want to lose a lot of money. But notice, I, I wanted to go back and pick that up because notice here when we look at the best 15 years, because now we're talking about 15-year periods, notice the best 15 years for the S&P 500 is 189 and compound rate of return. And the worst 15 years is a break-even, basically. So as you go out longer and longer, the difference between the best and the worst narrows. So by the time we go out, we look at every 40-year period since 1928, 55 of them. The average for the S&P 500 was 11. The average for the small cap value was 16.2. And what I tell people to hope for is that you get 10 with the S&P 500 and you get 12 for small cap value. But again, notice Notice how the compound rate of return, just looking at the one here, the S&P 500, notice how the compound rate of return, the best was 12.5, the worst was 18.9. So you can count, now when I say you can count on, the probabilities are over the next 40 years, you're going to be somewhere between those two numbers if you have some money in the S&P 500. And the same would be true of small cap value, somewhere between 11.6 and 19. So if you want to make more money, does it surprise you to find out that I would like you to add to a portfolio that might have the S&P 500. There are people who tell you to put all of your equities, all of your stock investment, just put it in the S&P 500 and be happy. And I'm not, I don't think that's stupid. I just think you're leaving a ton of money on the table. And the, I'm going to show you the risk in a few minutes. I'm going to show you the historic, the difference in the historic risk. And I hope it makes an impression. But you can see, I mean, you can see the difference. I already talked about these differences between the S&P 500 and small cap blend. 10.2 versus 11.2, 11 versus 13.7. So if you put some small cap, maybe it's only 10%. It will make a difference. Same thing with value, large value, small value. Put some in the portfolio. I'll show you how much in a few minutes. And by the way, I am sorry, I'm not looking at the chat, but at 79, I can't focus on the chat as well as focus on the presentation, but I promise I'm going to look at the chat later. Ah, I love this. We have over 160 tables on our website. Remember I said that the mission of our, of our, uh, of our foundation we are we don't earn money we make we get donations from people i put money in every year i put money in to get it started i'm trying to build it up so it'll be around after i'm gone and that everybody won't have to work for nothing we do have some the people who take care of our website do get paid but the people who do the heavy lifting research wise uh, we are, we are, we are all we are all donating our time. But here is the kind of table I love, a tool. What a tool this is. This table is about the S&P 500. Down the far right column is the year-by-year -year results. And by the way, I'm not asking you to look at all the results tonight, but when you have time, 
go back if you will. And in fact, I, I, I sent a PDF of this, uh, of this presentation so you can print these out easily, okay? And, the, and hopefully they'll be in the chat. So I know I can look year by year and I can get a feeling for what it would have been like. I know it lost money in 73 and 74. I know it lost money in 2008 because I can see the red color and I can see the minus. I also know what doesn't show up is one day in 1987, it lost 22% in one day. So you don't see all the risk here, but you see a lot of it. And down at the bottom of that page, you can even see the worst three months, the worst six months, the worst 12 months. You can be, you can really feel, maybe, I used to call this my fright simulator because it, it was a way of, of, of showing people what Wall Street doesn't normally show you. It's one thing to understand the upside. The sales pitch is always about the upside. But the idea is hope for the best, but prepare for the worst. Because if you're not prepared for the worst, you don't know how to deal with it. Because at your young ages, I promise you will see the worst of the, of the, of the next 50, 60, 70 years. And I can also see the worst drawdown from peak to valley at the very bottom of the page. But notice, it's not just about the S&P 500. It's about the S&P 500 and bonds. Because on the left-hand side, you have the year-by-year -year results of a, of a bond portfolio that's very low risk. In fact, if you look at its worst drawdown, it was 5%, I think. And the worst drawdown for the S&P 500 was 51%. But what happens is when you look at the return, the compound rate of return, the annualized rate of return, you'll notice every time if you start with 100% bonds and you start adding equity, every time you add equity, more equity, you get a higher return and you take on more risk. So this is what you need to become an expert on. It isn't on this table. This table is easy to produce. I hope it's easy to understand. What is difficult is what goes on inside you when your life savings is in, whether it's all equities or half equities, and figuring out how much risk you're willing to take. And hopefully when you're young, you will understand that the more risk you take, and I'm talking about smart risk, not stupid risk, you don't want bonds in your portfolio for the first 20 years. Well, I'll talk about that later. But here you can see it, the bottom of that page. The bottom of that page, you can see that 50-50 that made an annualized return of 9.4, 50 stocks, 50 bonds. And you can see the losses. Oh, by the way, that's what I'm, my wife and I are 50-50 stocks and bonds. We're not all in the S&P 500. We have most of our stock and investments in value, but we have some S&P 500. We have a lot in small. We have more in small than we do the S&P 500, but, but we do have the S&P 500. And I know that with the S&P 500, when I look at the worst 12 months, I should be ready to lose about 20 to 25% in a really bad 12 months. I, I guess to be fair, I should have the same periods, but the best three months and the best six months. I just don't have room on the page. But anyway, I'll do it in the future. Okay, now I know I don't have forever to talk to you. I'd love to go through all 160 tables, but let me tell you why I'm showing you this table and the next table. This table is the same kind of table, bonds on the left, equities on the right, but the equities are small cap value. The risk goes up and so does the return. There it is. The risk instead of 
it's the, the risk instead of here of being 51%, the worst drawdown was 61%. The worst, uh, the, the, the worst 12 months for a 50-50 with the small cap value and, and, and the, uh, uh, in the bonds, instead of 20 to 25, it's a little bit over 25. But I also see the return. The return is 14%. And the return for the 50-50 was 9.4 before. Now it's 11.1. And again, I'm thinking, oh, it looks like there's some half percent sitting in there somewhere. And this next table, again, we don't have time to look at it deeply, but I'll tell you what it is. The equity is half small cap value, and 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 half in uh, in uh, S and P five hundred for what it's worth. That combination of small cap value and the S and P five hundred. So some small, some out of out of favor, and those great growth companies. That is what I have asked my daughter to invest all of the money in this Roth IRA for the rest of her life. Now, when she is 18, she's going to find out about this project. And because I'm not likely to be alive when she reaches 18, she's going to get a letter from me as what the dream was for her grandmother and her grandfather. What we hoped this Roth I would, would grow and be for her, not just for living, but for giving. And maybe being able to be more forgiving. But uh, I know I'm realistic. I don't, you don't have to have 10 or 20 or $50 million in a pool for somebody to crawl across crushed glass. There are salespeople who will crawl across crushed glass if you got $100,000. She is going to spend a lifetime, if people know that's there, trying to convince her she should do something else. And my goal for that wonderful little girl, baby, she's a, just a little tiny baby. By the way, nine pound baby, she was born. Uh, she uh, uh, she will hopefully have an education that will last a lifetime. And, and that's what I want for you. That's why when I come here, I could be spending my, my, my afternoon uh, relaxing, figuring out if anybody got elected here in the last few hours. But I'd rather be here. And I would rather be making this case to you about what you should be thinking about for the rest of your life. Because this presentation, as far as I believe, and, and I'm just like your professors, by the way, I don't, I don't, I am not a professional teacher, and they are, but I am this. I am trying to, to motivate, to educate and motivate you to make use of the information that I'm trying, I'm, I'm sharing with you. The reason I support, I support this class at Western Washington University. I pay $50,000 a year so that class exists. It's because I want those young people to come out of there. And when they do their first 401k, they know what to do. They do the right thing from day one. All right. Anyway, you can compare. In fact, you can compare all three of them at one time. Not now, because I'm running out of time, and I don't want to keep you any longer than I have to. But I want you to see there's always this choice. You can control the pain. I want you to focus on the gain in the early years. You can take a lot of pain because when you are investing in equities and when they are going down like they will maybe in the early years of your investing, remember you are buying more shares of great companies. When it's going up, you're buying fewer shares. And I'll talk about, in fact, I'll go right now to that page, just so you'll know what I'm talking about. When you are investing, this is Idea number 10, when you're investing, you when you dollar cost average, you put $100 or 
$500 a month into the market, into your 401k, into whatever mutual funds you've chosen. When you're doing that, your $500 is going to buy more shares if what you're buying costs $10 than if it costs $20. That's obvious. But when the market is down from 10, from 20 to 10, who I don't know if I want to put any more money. It's so painful. It doesn't feel right. I've, I've been losing money. Why don't I wait until later? Because you want to buy all of those cheap shares as you possibly can. Do I wish that somebody could have told you for the next six months, hold your money aside because six months from now, this market's going down or will be down. And you're going to be smart. You're going to keep your money out of the market. Oh, there's always people who call the future. They talk like they know. Nobody knows. Everybody in the industry knows nobody knows. The reason the market exploded today is because a report came out that people didn't expect. And that was its suggestion that inflation might be peaking out. People got all excited. Future returns of your investments will be based on the unexpected, not the expected. Yes, we expect that capitalism is going to work. We don't know that. We expect that people are going to come to work in these thousands and thousands of public companies and be going to work to work hard and do their best every day. Well, we probably question that, but, we, but we're hoping they're doing their best because they're working for us. I'm going back to buy and hold versus market timing. Number nine, market timing feels so good. I am, I am truly an expert on market timing. I have studied market timing since I was 22 years old. It is ways of being in and out of the market and using techniques some people use what they think it's going to do. Some people use mechanical techniques to do market timing. But I'm going to tell you, I have known thousands of market timers. Very few of them are successful because market timing requires a, a, a strength of character to withstand what is the hardest of all kinds of, of, of strategies that you have to do because when you buy and hold, there's one thing you have to do. You have to buy. And then you know you have to hold. Those are two very easy things to understand. And if you come to the table of investing and you understand that you're going to be in there and the market's going to be all over the place, but you know that's what it's going to be. But over long periods of time, it's going to be good, et cetera. But so many people got out of the market in 2009, and 10 years later, they were still trying to figure out how to get back in, and the market had skyrocketed. Don't. I mean, really, if you want to deal with the probabilities, I can teach anybody how to buy and hold. I could teach a room full of people to do exactly that, that, I would show them a system. They would invest their money in equities for 20 years, half in small cap value, half in the S&P 500. Oh, you want to be more diversified? 25% in the S&P 500, 25% in small cap value, small cap blend, and large cap value. That works too. But all the people who do it on the same day, they all do it the same. The result will be the same theoretically 40 years from now. But market timing is driven more by emotions than it is by the math. And the minute we leave the math, we reach to our inner self. And there's this thing called the, I, I call it the, it's, it's a strategy. It is a legitimate strategy to market time. It's the ICSIA strategy. I can't stand it anymore. And so people move, whether it's getting in or getting out, they move because they're looking either for, for safety, they, they, they're they so fearful. And, and I don't blame them. They've been losing money. Don't do it. And I'm sorry, uh, while I can answer your questions, 
I can't be your advisor because I'm not an advisor anymore. I'm just a teacher. I'm going to leave you with this. Again, I know I've got about 15 minutes. I want you to know about this table. This, this table is maybe in some ways one of the most important. And we got a whole bunch of them. This one happens to be of the S&P 500. And it assumes you're starting in 1970. You're investing $1,000 a year in the S&P 500 or any combination of the S&P 500 in 10% increments of that and bonds, okay? So it's the results of what you already saw in, in the, in the fine-tuning tables. I want you to increase the investment 3% every year. Now, there are so many lessons, and I do podcasts. I, we have on our website 700 articles and podcasts and videos uh, and, and we're not asking you to write any checks. You don't have to, nothing to pay us. And, oh, I'll tell you what we love. I'd love it if you read that book. We're talking millions that you have access to a free copy and then go to go to Amazon and write a, a review because I can tell you that that is worth uh, as much as, as any, uh, well, not as, any contribution that has ever been made, but I will tell you, it's a huge contribution because it helps convince other people to take advantage of that information. Now, notice if you look under the 100% stock portfolio, that the third column from the right, you can see what's happened into your thousand dollars that you're putting in. First year, it ends at the end of the first year, it's a thousand twenty-two. Wow, that's not a very good return, is it? No. The next year, you're up to 2275 and you keep doing this. You keep adding the 1000 but it's but it's being increased by 3% every year. And you can see that annual contribution going down the far right column. And by the end of the 10, first 10 years, there's $16,245. You put in over 10000 and you only have 16? What is wrong? Two things are wrong. One is that your thousand dollars a year, I mean, you didn't start with ten thousand, you ended with over ten thousand, but some of that money didn't come into the last five years. But the market did not do very well during that 10 year period, one of the worst 10 years in stock market history. But it was okay. But understand, you were the hero. You are in partnership with the market. You put in the $10,000 plus into your part of the partnership. The market is your partner. Benjamin Graham, the father of security analyst, one of the most famous people in terms of finance in the industry, he calls the market Mr. Market. So you're in partnership with Mr. Market. Notice what happened. You kept on doing it the next 10 years. At the end of that 10 year, you had 119,884. All of a sudden, the market's doing, Mr. Market is doing its part. And then at the end of the next five, 10 years, it's up to 699. And then at the end of the next 10 years, it is down to 662. That's because the S&P 500 had a terrible decade. But I want you to see something here. On the next on the next one we're looking at the small cap value instead of the S&P 500. I want you to notice that where the S&P 500 at remember it was down to 662. Let me see if I can gingerly put this over here down here 22.6 million he had the S&P had that part of the market had 662 that's the reward for taking more risk but i will tell you there'll be periods that the small cap value will hurt not help but if you had combined the two it wasn't too bad if you had combined the two that year that you would have had 662, 2009 was the end of that decade. Okay, you got a million three. You got twice as much money as if you had your money in the S&P 500 only. Number 11, taxable versus tax deferred versus tax free. I'll tell you, for your long-term money, I don't care what tax bracket you're in. 
I am an advocate of Roth IRAs. I want to tell you something that I, I felt that you haven't felt. I hope you never feel. What I felt was when I first came in, graduated from the University of, at, 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 at Western in, in uh, Bellingham, Washington, the highest marginal tax rate was 90%. The, uh, when I started as a stockbroker in 1966, the highest was about 70%. We have no idea what tax rates will be in the future. And to the extent that we can get money put aside tax-free for the rest of our life, particularly when you're young and you're not in a very high tax bracket, I want you to be tax-free. Roths. For people who do not know what to do, do not want, don't want to have anything to do with me after tonight because you do not want to be a do-it-yourself investor. You do not want to try to save that $5 million. You do not want to take advantage of some of these different asset classes because, because I, I showed you how to do it. But I will tell you what I want you to learn more about. By the way, I've got, uh, I've got a whole a video and podcast on target date funds. They are an amazing product. Hopefully you'll be in something like the Vanguard target date fund where it's all in index funds. But what happens is you, you get into a fund that knows that you want to retire in 2070, for example, and you put your money in there and they manage it the way a professional would manage that money. They don't like small cap value, particularly. They don't like large cap value, particularly. They'll be more oriented to the large companies. They'll have a balance of U.S. and international. They'll add a fixed income. I think they add fixed income too soon for, for what, what I would want you to do, but they do it in the way that is very traditional. And they take care of the money for the rest of your life. And remember that 8% I started out talking to you about in, in that first, uh, where I said eight or eight and a half, target date funds are built to make between about eight and eight and a half or 9% over a lifetime. But by the time you are, well, 50 years old, they'll have you probably 20% in bonds. When you're 55, you'll be 30 or 40. You'll have more bonds sooner than I probably would have you in bonds, but they are super. And Wharton did a study. They looked at 12, I'm sorry, 1.2 million uh, accounts at Vanguard. And they determined that people who use target date funds would likely make about 2.3% better per year during their investing years than people who were trying to pick stuff on their own. If you don't do really know what you're doing, I don't want you to be a do-it-yourselfer. I think you'll hurt yourself. But if you know what you're doing, that's great. But if you don't know what you're doing, and a lot of people just don't want to deal with this. Now, engineers are pretty good about trying to take on these kind of things. It's easy for them. There's not one thing you're going to learn in the process of investing that is nearly as difficult as what you've gone through to be where you are. I mean, I can't even start to say how, how, how little you really have to know to understand the process of investing. I've already made this point. I'm not going to focus on it anymore. You, you got it. That first five years is so important because if, it, 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 it turns out that the, what you would make in the first five years of putting away $6,000 a year before somebody else gets started, your first year's 5% distribution would be $112,000, okay, that you should likely get from that. And that, that, that was not based on huge returns. This is a page from our website. If you went to paulmerriman.com. There is a link to best advice. There, the most important information on our website is in that dropdown. One of those is sound investing portfolios. These are different portfolios using different kinds of asset classes. For example, remember I talked about the, uh, the two fund strategy. Uh, partly in in U.S. and and partly in uh, uh, in, in uh, large and value, 
and and for some reason, oh here here it is down here on on the bottom. Oh God, that these two funds down here at the bottom. This is the fifty percent small cap and fifty percent large cap. Then all of these different strategies, we can look back at the last fifty two years. We can show you with all these different portfolios, what would an investment in $10,000 have produced? And you can see the difference in different decades. Like the S&P 500 didn't do so well in 70 to 79. It didn't do so well in 09 from 2000 to 09, but you can compare it to the different strategies. And you can look, how many up years did each strategy have? How many down years did each strategy have? If you added up all the down years, how much did all the down years add up? I mean, this is not tough math. And notice with the S&P 500, the worst year was a loss of 37. The sum of all the down years was 141.1%. But if we go over here, to the small cap value on the far right. The worst year was a minus 36.8. And the total of all of, of, the, uh, of, of the bad years, the losing years, was 130. It was actually, by some measures, less risky. And what did it mean that you would have made with the S&P, you would have made $2.3 million for a $10,000 investment. With the combination of the small cap value and the S&P, $5.3 million. I also want you, we have a lot of what we call quilt charts on our site. They are underneath that, that, that drop down of best advice. This shows you going back to 1928, one year at a time, how did the S&P 500 do against the all value? Green in the S&P, yellow is all value. How did the two fund strategy do? How did the four fund strategy do? In, in uh, excuse me, I said yellow was all value. That was wrong. Uh, yellow is a is a combination of large and small value. The blue is the small value. I apologize. For five years, the S&P 500 is at the top. Starts to feel like that's the only place to be. But then when you go into the period from uh, 1938 to 1947, S&P 500 was at the bottom. Six years in a row. Look at the lower right-hand corner. You can look at how often those asset classes or combinations of asset classes were at the top and how often were they at the bottom. And what I love about the two-fund strategy, and by the way, I do about the four-fund strategy, powerful, powerful strategies, how often they're in the middle. I think we're better off if we kind of stay in the middle most of the time. Pay off for getting an education. You're going to retire earlier if you want to. By the way, if you're new to investing, you're going to find there's a whole bunch of people out there in the FI community. It's called financial independence. They want to retire early. They call it the FIRE movement. But you invest right I think when you invest right, you can retire earlier if you want to, or you can leave more to others, or you can live on more when you do retire. You're going to have more diversification because you understand the process. You're going to have less risk. You're going to pay less in expenses. You're going to own more equities. You're going to pay less in taxes. I mean, it isn't hard to be, it is what Warren Buffett is right. There's only a few things to do right. And I will tell you, he says, as long as you don't do too many things wrong, but for every right thing there is to do, there are at least a hundred wrong things. So as I said before, go to best advice. 
Our job is to help you. We are not financial planners. We are not trying to do estate planning. We are not trying to take care of your insurance, anything. We just want to help you invest. And there's our website. And there's a calculator. Young fellow used our site to learn how to invest. And he looked at a bunch of them and he liked what we were doing. He didn't like that we didn't have a calculator to do to, to tell people, let people manipulate all those numbers. He developed it, he used it, and he brought it to us and he gave it to us as a gift. It's an amazing gift. And there we are. We hope you sign up for our newsletter. I know you're not going to use this stuff now. And I know you're going to hate the emails coming in once every two weeks. That's what, Once every two weeks, you'll get something from us. But I want to make sure that you don't lose our email for when you graduate and it's time for that 401k. This stuff is important when you're making one of the biggest decisions of your life. I didn't die. Um, so what do you think? I mean, are there any thumbs up at all? Of course, I have not been able to see your faces. Uh, I, I would. How many? We still got most of the people. We got 144 people that stayed. Wow. And how many are napping? I want to know. None, I hope. Uh, and so uh, is there anything I can do that can promote an open dialogue here, McCunn? Um, you know, um, we would love to ask you some questions to start off with. I'm um, here. We've actually, um, Manny Mishoyer has prepared um, a set of questions for us, for that matter. Um, if Good. You to, um, answer. Um, but first of all, thank you so much for joining us, Paul. Thank you for spending your time to prepare this presentation for us and for teaching us all these important tidbits that we can keep with us for the rest of our lives. You're welcome. And I, on it, I really do hope it helps. For sure. But now I wanted to start off asking you, um, would you suggest that we invest in all small cap value? All small cap value as uh, for the first 20 years would be okay. okay. Absolutely. Small cap value has never underperformed the S&P 500 uh, for uh, over 20, I mean, they've always outperformed over 20 year periods, uh, but they often underperform. They've had about three 20 year periods or almost 20 year periods where they produce the same return as the S&P 500. And, and what, I, what I don't want is for people to get discouraged. And one of the challenges is that we've all heard in our lives, somebody said something was going to happen and then it didn't. Uh, people say, I, I promise I will marry you and we'll stay together forever. And they don't. And, and, and so when do you, when does the pain become so great that you say, I want a divorce? And, and that happens with what you think is a commitment to an investment that is supposed to treat you in a certain way. So the, the, one of the reasons that, that, as I may have mentioned, I can't remember now, but when I'm setting up this program and why I recommended that my daughter put it half in the S&P 500 and half in small cap value, and it will mean millions and millions of dollars in, different, in, in, in what she'll have to, to live on, and to, but it will smooth the curve. She will, and, the, and the neat thing is, we're going to be able to show her 18 years of performance. She will see what it was like. Now, we have on our website, when you look at that information, uh, there's there's another table that shows the year by year performance over the last 52 years of all those different strategies. Exactly. So and, you know, you'll be able to look at it. Yes. And we see that we see that through the um, through the data that you've provided for us that worldwide small cap value. We have a split 50-50 between U.S. small cap value and worldwide small cap value provides the best possible return over any length of time, right? 
Well, let me tell you the rest of the story. Uh, there was a relatively short period of time that gave you the advantage. Uh, and it was a period of time that the U.S. market was underperforming. And if you didn't have that period of time, you wouldn't have that. So it was a relatively few number of years that caused that small difference. The main thing to me is have that, a certain amount of value in the portfolio. I, I think the all value portfolio, which has some large in it, is also a wonderful long-term portfolio. And what I'm thinking is, in many cases, you're going to have some money later in, in your life. You're going to have some money, maybe in a Roth, some money in a 401k plan. You may even have a taxable account. You may have, have a partner and your partner has a different account. You could have a portfolio between the two of you. You got one that's all value. You got one that's a two fund. You got one that's the U.S. all. And you and you diversify. It, it's, it's not... It's going to hurt you to the extent that we always know what we should have had all of our money in, but that's because there's no risk in the past. I mean, it's stupid. I just didn't take my money in 1986 and put it all in Microsoft. I wouldn't have to have, I, maybe I wouldn't be here. All right. Thank you for telling us that, Paul. Um, but I also wanted to open up the um, floor for anybody else who has any particular questions that they want to ask Paul. Were there any in the chat, by the way? Any questions that... Uh... Now, I did look at the chat throughout. Oh, we do have one question in the chat. Good. Ahmed is asking, do you know any good ways of saving money without accumulating interest on those savings? Ah, well, there there is a mutual fund family. The I, I don't know if this if, is an Islam, Islamic, uh, uh, I mean, there's a reason why they don't want the interest. Uh, there's a, 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 a actually a mutual fund company out of Bellingham, Washington. I believe it's the Amana Funds. Now that name may have changed, but uh, but but they are built to to uh, to work within, the set of, of beliefs of people who are limited as to what interest uh, they can get. Thank you for that, Paul. Yep. We have another question from Irfan. Is there an ETF through which we can specifically invest in small cap value, or do we have to individually invest in them? We are doing everything we can to make this all possible for you without you having to dig as deep as you would normally have to dig. We've done the digging for you. There are seven things that we're trying to do. And one of those seven is to give you the names of the mutual funds or ETFs to invest in. So there will be a link on our website to our portfolios. And when you end up at our portfolios, you will see the ETFs and you'll go to the ETFs and you will see under the ETFs, the best in class. And so we have actually, uh, Chris Pedersen, the fellow that has retired from NVIDIA, uh, Chris is the one who has done the work looking at all the things we believe in, size, value, all there's a whole bunch of things that go into it. There's an article there about how he selects them. And for example, the small cap value, the ticker symbol is A-V as in Victor, U-V as in Victor. And that is the, I have that in my portfolio. And every year or two, he updates that. And, and, and sometimes there's a bit of a challenge because if you're inside of a Roth IRA, no problem. But if you're in a taxable account, all of a sudden you have to make the decision, well, is it good enough? I mean, we will have a reason for why, not because we think it's a better fund for the next year, we think from everything we know, it's a better fund for the future. We are never recommending something short term. All right. Thank you. Um, we're going further. Up. And also, please, if you guys want to interrupt with um, questions of your own, please go right ahead. I'm just reading straight from the chat. Um, but please feel free to turn on your mic and, and ask your questions. But in the meanwhile, I will go through the chat. Hannah Schwartz is asking. Um, I was wondering what you thought of robo-advisors. 
which is an auto-managed mutual fund, which doesn't have any fees. For example, Schwab um, or something similar. Well, robo advisors. If you, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing most of you know what that is. But everything is robotically moved for you. You just put it there. That's what a target date fund is. A target date fund is a robo advisor. They do the moving. All you do is hang on. Now, some robo like like Schwab. And, and I don't know the very latest information, but sometimes there are internal expenses. I know, for example, in the case of Schwab, they got into trouble at one point because they were making a lot of, they were requiring that people hold some, some money market funds inside of that free, uh, uh, that free account. And, 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 and so it wasn't really free as you might think as free. But here, here is the question. Is that robo-advisor going to be diversified for the long term and be in your best interest? So again, the, the problem is you may not know enough about small and large and value and growth and all of the, and, and there are other things that go into that formula. For example, how what's the quality of the portfolio? What's the momentum? Do they use momentum in their portfolio as to how they hold the, the the asset classes. There's a whole bunch of things that go into the analysis. The robo advisor is going to have a, a portfolio that is likely different than ours. There is a website in It's called if you look up uh, 243 portfolios. Oh, the Einstein portfolios. There are 243 different portfolios. All I want those people to do for you is to do what we've done for you. Show us what it looks like in the past. Show us what the risk is. Show us what the likely return is. Do it with indexes, not with actively managed. But yes, a robo-advisor can be just fine because a target date fund is just fine. But the question will be, when will you start adding fixed income? We actually have a recommended target date, aggressive target date portfolio formula on our website. Chris Patterson developed that. But we leave a little work to be done. We don't do it for you. Thanks, Paul. Manny asks, what do you think, what is your opinion of REITs as an investment option? If you looked at the ultimate buy and hold strategy, you know, all those different portfolios that I showed you, one of them has 10 different asset classes in it. I have those 10 asset classes. I have REITs. REITs are tax inefficient, good inside of a Roth. They have about the same return as the S&P 500. And that's not bad. They are not too correlated with the S&P 500. They go up and down at different times from the S&P 500. And we actually, if you go, if you go to that best advice and you look, uh, if you click on the ultimate buy and hold strategy, there's a complete explanation in an article. There's a podcast there uh, uh, as well and tables that will show you where REITs fit in the, the total portfolio. I mean, having 90 minutes with you guys is just not enough, but hopefully it will attract you to come check out that best advice, those links. There is a, there's an article and a podcast and tables with all of those different, uh, 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 different discussion points. Awesome. All right. Thank you for that, Paul. Do we have any other questions at all? By the way, I mean, may, I, may I make one comment? For sure, please. Before I forget, somebody in this group at some point is going to want to write a financial newsletter. It's not what they expected to do. Uh, but if I'm still around, uh, they can contact me. One of the best newsletters in the industry is called The White Coat Investor and uh, online. And it's, it's, it's managed by a guy who's a physician. And it's a wonderful, wonderful website. So uh, my job is to help people that are helping others. 
And I'm hoping, by the way, that many of you will take this information and that book, that link to that book home to show your parents, because I find that a lot of parents aren't exactly doing the right thing. All right. Um, thank you for that, Paul. Actually, um, you know, I've been able to, you know, talk to my parents about all the things that you have you have taught me um, through your website and everything. We've had so many lively discussions, actually. So for Great. sure, um, share Paul's website with your parents, guys. Um, it's just really fascinating stuff that can really impact our, our financial lives. Um, but yes, if you guys have any further questions, email Paul paul at paulmerriman.com. I will send all of you all um, the PDF of the presentation, the video of the presentation. Uh, I will send him, uh, I will send you guys Paul's contact information, everything you guys will need, and you can reach out to Paul whenever you want. Great. Thank but you so now, much, you guys. You guys are wonderful. I wish, I wish you well. Uh, I hope you don't have to go through the terrible bear markets that I've had to go through. I hope you don't ever have to go through a divorce. By the way, a divorce is the equivalent of a bear market. Uh, I, I just wish you the best. And you are going in to one of the great, great careers. I will tell you, the STEM people are the people who follow our work. And to be invited here tonight, that's really important because I, I know that I have high confidence this kind of information, it may not be mine, but this kind of information at some point is going to be important to you. All the best to all of you. Thank you so much, Mukund. Thank you so much for this. I really appreciate it. Um, and RHC appreciates it too. So great. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, folks. Good night, all y'all. Thank you. Paul Merriman with Sound Investing. Sound Investing, soundinvesting.com and paulmerriman.com are produced and exclusively owned by Paul Merriman, who is solely responsible for their content. For more information, free articles, mutual fund recommendations, and more, visit paulmerriman.com.